Okay, there are a few stories that Vancouver it's like more than a snow day here because it rarely happens and talking about housing. Housing affordability, obviously a huge issue out here. And today I've got uh, Josh Gordon with me. He's a senior analyst with Statistics Canada. I dragged him out from behind the desk because he has done some really interesting research. And we're standing here um, on the west side of Vancouver, close to Queen Elizabeth Park in this neighborhood that is essentially completely changed in the last five-ish years, I'd say. And it was just packed with new condos you know there's the screens to my left and uh, there's new builds being developed uh, as we speak essentially and so Josh I want to ask you when you look around a neighborhood like this thinking about the research that you've done what do you see so what we what we did was we looked at the the share of investment properties for uh, new condominiums what we found was that around half of all new condominiums in uh, Vancouver were uh, investment properties. This is the first time we were hearing these numbers, so uh, this is a, a bit of a, a first. And 50%, uh, I don't think I necessarily expected it, but I haven't seen the data before, and I'm guessing you haven't either. Well, what were some of the other highlights um, that you found from your data? Around 13% uh, of single detached properties were investment properties, which is higher than other cities. Uh, in Toronto, it's about 10% or, or 9%. I, th I thought it was really interesting just because some of the studies that were referenced, I clicked a little deeper and yep. basically found like the, a number of these researchers had said that the more, higher your investor number of investors, often like the, the higher your housing prices tend to go up, which I thought. Some people have found that. Again, we, we uh, stayed away from making causal claims. Uh, that was not the nature of the, the project for us. But others, researchers and others in the, in the public debate will be able to use those data to, to make those types of uh, uh, analyses. You're not supposed to be, give comment on it? No, oh, sorry. I'm joking. It's Josh has all these rules that he can't talk about because he's with StatsCan. They are just about the numbers, not here to give you analysis <laughs> or opinions. Maybe some no. analysis, no opinion. But Josh, this is, a, this is a unit that you wanted to bring my attention to. Yes. This is a laneway home. There is a higher rate of these types of properties in uh, Vancouver for sure. And so this uh, in our data would be considered a, a property with multiple residential units. In many cases, you'll have the owner who lives in the, the main unit and then rents out potentially. And so in that circumstance, we would call this an owner occupied investment property. Just to get at this idea that it's not fully an investment property as we typically think of it. And so in Vancouver, around 15% of properties uh, are this owner occupied investment uh, property type which is higher than, than most other um, uh, metropolitan areas. Right, so obviously affordability, a, a huge concern for all of us here um, in, in BC. What has the data told you about where incomes are versus the cost of housing? Because there's been some research into that from StatsCan too. And in Vancouver, you have uh, a greater kind of uh, disparity between the, the prices and the incomes. You have a what's called a price to income ratio, so uh, kind of an assessed value to the family income ratio of about 10. Um, and in most other cities, it's, it's lower than that. So in Toronto, it's around uh, six, and then in Halifax, That's it's around three. Different. It's, it is different, yes. Okay, so what does that say, say about what's happening in this market then? Well, uh, that's for a range of people to, to <laughs> opine about. The data that we will collect moving forward will really be able to give us a better sense of, uh, you know, is investor behavior kind of increasing or decreasing in the, right. in the housing market. And there, there's policy implications there, right? Because if you have, you know, more and more investors buying, then the concern could be. I'm going to say it because Josh is in It could be that, you know, policymakers are, are catering to, you know, the, the desires of essentially developers in um, doing more, more investment properties. StatsCan provides the data to have more productive discussions around these topics. Without that data, you're claiming this, you're claiming that, but, but nobody's sure whether that's accurate or not. Mm -hmm. And so at least you can have a more evidence-based discussion. Um, and yeah, we, we don't make a determination around kind of whether investment properties or investors are good or bad. That's not, yeah. not the, the purpose of the project. Investment properties are also a source of, of rental, right? Yes. And that's, sure. that's how uh, many rental needs are met. Yeah. Um, and so there's, there's different sides to this. Yeah. Um, and, and that's again where we don't, we don't take a stand. Um, you have left me with more questions. Some good answers, great answers, but Fair many enough. questions. And we are going to find some more answers to the new questions I have. Thanks. It was so great to talk. Thank to you. you. Yeah. So 
the person we found to hopefully give us some more context is a professor named Patrick Condon. He used to be a city planner, but now he's here at UBC teaching at the uh, School of Architecture and Landscape. And it's really interesting because he used to write books pushing for more supplies, so more condos, more houses, try and lower the cost of housing. But he has dramatically changed his tune, doesn't believe that anymore. I want to know why, and I want to know what he thinks about this new data. So let's go talk to him. For the first 25 years of my career, I was saying build, 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 but I no longer believe that. What, what I wrote changed? books was, about was it. Was there a moment that changed things for you? Vancouver. You know, just looking at this and seeing all the efforts that we've made here in the city. No other city in uh, North America has come even close to doing the same thing that we have done and it hasn't, it hasn't produced affordability. Okay, but we keep seeing um, you know, all these new houses, I would say if anything, more condos being built. There's so many of them. So is that not supposed to help? If adding supply would have helped us, then we should have the cheapest housing in the world almost because no other center city has done anything even remotely close in terms of supply. Mm -hmm. Adding supply is nice for many reasons. It makes the city better. It makes it function better and people have nice places to live. That's great. Do it for that reason, but don't tell me it's going to make things more affordable. So what about purpose-built rental? We hear that term a lot. No, yeah. Um, unfortunately, I'm really a skeptic even on pur purpose-built rental. Vancouver, for example, city of Vancouver has led the region by an enormous amount in the production of purpose-built rental. And the theory was that by doing that, you'd get people to move out of existing rentals into the new rentals, and that would free up the, the previous rental. It makes common sense. It should make rents cheaper, you know? There should be downward pressure on rent. But what has happened is when people have moved out of those cheaper apartments, those apartments have just rented for the same price as the new expensive ones. And along this corridor here that we're sitting on, the price of a one bedroom now is over $2,000, commonly $2,500 for, for a one bedroom, which is way beyond the capacity of the average wage earner in this city to afford. We just talked to Josh Gordon over at StatsCan, and he had some really interesting numbers, but I was hoping to get some context from you. You know, what did you make of all of it? You know, particularly the idea that uh, when we're talking about condos, we're looking at nearly 40, more than 40% of it is investors. H how does that change the market when that happens? This information that he put out basically is just another aspect of the much larger phenomenon, which is that uh, wealth globally, not just here in Vancouver, is flowing towards people who already have wealth. Say you have a home in Dunbar, suddenly it's worth two million, you're able to leverage a lot more mo money from the bank. The way it is now is they basically have two classes. One is people who have assets and those who don't. Those are the two classes. And the, and, and the people who have assets, and, and I'm not talking about rich people, I'm talking about normal people, particularly people in my generation, who ended up with... Boomers again. Yeah, boomers, boomers again, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. End up with $4 million. They really don't know what to do with it. And they can leverage that money and buy yet another condo and yet another condo. And they might put the kids in it, but they might not. They consider it an investment. And as that money moves to people who have money, it makes it harder and harder for people, particularly your age, who don't have all that equity built up to get in and play the game. So you never get your chance to build equity. Okay, all right, lots to chew on there. Thank you so much for chatting with us today. Yeah, Patrick. I'm sure that's it. enough. That was great, thank you.